So I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, first of all, verse 27 and 28. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. Now I want to park here for a moment because traditionally when this verse is read about communion, what we do is we say, you know, if you're participating in a particular sin, if there's something that's not right between you and the Lord, you need to get that right before you come to the communion table. If you have unforgiveness for somebody in the church, that's usually how we look and we examine ourselves for sin. That's not what it's saying. Although we should do that. And let me explain. We have an open communion table here, which means you do not have to officially be a member of this local congregation to partake in, in the communion service here. However, it would be incredibly unfitting, ill-seeming, rude, if you were to take of this communion either as one who has not submitted themselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ or if you are practicing some sort of immorality, whether it be sexual immorality, or in business, or if whatever it is, whatever you are practicing, it would not be fitting for you to come in here twice. And here's where all of the, everyone else has to really move their thoughts for a moment. Anyone who approaches the table, it says, without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Well, what does that mean? Well, first of all, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the very next chapter, Paul says this, Now you, that's a plural you, you all, you, us, are the body of Christ and individually members of him. If you approach this communion table without considering for a moment that you are joined with every single believer in this room. You are joined closer than a blood relative. You need to get that right now. You are closer than a blood relative. You are part of the same body. If you approach this table as an individual without just considering that, that's what the verse says. Another thing, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16 says this. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. When we talk about the body of Christ, Jesus is the head, and we are all attached. He breathes, his breath comes into me, his breath comes into Don, his breath comes into Beverly. We are breathing the same air, the Holy Spirit of God. His heart pumps and we share in the blood vessels that pass through this body to approach the table without recognizing the miraculous thing that, that God did. When you were baptized into Christ, you were baptized, you were plunged into his body. It's why we dip. You are plunged. It's not you got a little bit. You are plunged into the body of Christ. Consider the two commandments that all other commandments fulfill. Love God. Love Christ the head. Love the people sitting next to you as we approach this table. Now, what we're going to do a little bit differently, I want to give you time to examine yourself. I want you to consider where you are in the body of Christ. Are you in the body of Christ? And whenever you're ready, the deacons will be standing here Come to the table and take the cup with the bread, the cup with the, the juice, and go sit down and wait for everyone. But instead of the deacons bringing it to you today, we'll come and take it from the table. There will be deacons here to assist if you need. Also, those of you who can't make your way up here, don't try. One of the deacons will bring you what you need. Okay? And so let's just pause for a moment. I'll play something soft, something worshipful. You're welcome to sing with me as you make your way to the table. 
And whenever you're ready, come and, and, uh, and take the elements. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now listen. There's a particular word in this next line that he said that I want us to pay attention to. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim, there's the word, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's the job that's left for us. And that's going to be our topic this morning. And so uh, if you guys want to pick up the cups for folks or, so their hands are free, that's fine. And uh, for everyone else, if you please turn in your Bible to the book of Acts. I'm going to read the text this morning. It's uh, verse, or chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. I'll be reading in the English Standard Version. Now, uh, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them. Walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this or why do you stare at us? As though by our own power or piety, we made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, who God raised from the dead. To this we are all witness. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. Now, there are numerous sermons that could be preached from this passage of Scripture, and so in the coming weeks, we'll probably preach them. There's just no way to bring out all of the wonder that are ours, that are hidden in this. So I'm just going to begin one sermon today, and if you're going, wait, how come he's not preaching on this verse? We'll get there. I, I, I pose that to you because I would like you to pay particular attention to the message that I believe God is speaking to us today. So first of all, let's look at this proclamation of Peter. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. 
And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. Now, Peter and John are going to get arrested for this. And tomorrow they're going to be asked, why are you speaking of the resurrection? Because it was the Sadducees who had them arrested and they didn't believe in a resurrection. And second, why are you preaching the resurrection of Jesus, the man that we judged and we determined that he was a false prophet and we put him to death for being a false prophet and now you are saying that he was not a false prophet and in fact, not only was he a true prophet, but far beyond that, he is actually the Messiah of Israel which was promised. It says they were annoyed at Peter and John for that. Can you imagine? And so that's their pocket proclamation. But they give some substantiation to their proclamation. And I would like us to pay close attention to that. Uh, first of all, Peter begins in verse 13 by saying, your God, the God of Israel. He says, you see, he's talking to an audience entirely of Jews. They are in the temple. He's speaking to a crowd of those who have the covenant, those who are promised the land, those who have been given the law and the prophets, those who have the temple, those who have the presence of God in the temple. He speaks to them and he says to them, your God, the one that you believe in, your God is the one who has glorified this Jesus. Well, when did God the Father glorify Jesus? I want to share that with you, and I want you to know that Peter was there every time it happened. And so Peter is able to stand and speak to a Jewish congregation and say, the God that you have worshipped for eons, he has said, I don't care what your temple authority says, he has said, this is the one I approve, and this is the only Messiah I'm going to give you. You need look for no other. Well, when did God glorify him? There are three that, ways that I want to show you. There may be others. I just pulled these three. First of all, God glorified Jesus. When I say glorified, proclaimed that he was the Messiah by Jesus' works. Luke chapter 7, you can see it up here, Luke 7, 21 through 23. John the Baptist is in prison, and he's expecting Jesus to, to kick Rome out and to sit on David's throne and, and make Israel uh, this theocracy that will rule the other nations, and it's not happening. And now he's in prison in front of this corrupt Herod king who's only partial Jew. Things are really out of whack for John. And so John's expecting, you know, when are the chariots from heaven going to come and set things right? And so he sends his disciples finally to Jesus and says, now, are you really the one, or should I look for another? Here's Jesus' reply. That hour, he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. Now, if you read that fast, it doesn't mean anything, but he did it. And he answered them, go and tell John what you have seen. And heard the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. John, I am the Messiah, and here's your proof. Look at the works that I am doing. In fact, Jesus points to those works again in John chapter 14. Remember, he tells the disciples, he says, now, now uh, I'm going to go away. I'm going to go the place I'm going. You know where I'm going, and you know the way. I'm going to the Father, and you know the way to get there. And and Philip's like, well, oh, show, show us the way. What are you talking about? You know, and and uh, uh, and, and Jesus, uh, Philip finally says, just show us the Father, and that'll be enough. And Jesus says, have you been with me, Philip, all of this time? 
and you don't know who I am? John 14, 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on the count of the works himself. Philip, you saw me raise the dead. I am God. I am the anointed one of Israel. I am the Holy One, and there is none other. In Acts chapter 2, like a couple of days before this event happens in the temple, by the way, you'll notice Peter and John are on their way to the temple in the hour of prayer. My house will be a house of prayer. I just say that. Maybe sometimes when you come to church, it may not be the hour of worship like this, but you might choose one of the prayer meetings. Come at the, there were different hours. There was a time of sacrifice. There was a time of singing worship, but there was an hour of prayer, and we have an hour of prayer here. You might want to attend. But in the very first sermon that, pre that Peter preaches after the baptism of the Holy Spirit lands on the church, he says in verse 22 of Acts 2, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourself did. Peter is saying, you saw, you all saw, all of you gathered here right now in Jerusalem saw Jesus do these things. It was the Father himself doing them through Jesus. God has confirmed that Jesus is the Messiah in those works. But that's not the only thing that Jesus gives us as far as how we can know for sure that he is the only one. Also, he speaks of a testimony of two witnesses. In John chapter 8, would you turn there please? John chapter 8, beginning in verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisee said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one, yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two persons is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears me witness about me. Now, here's the two witnesses. Me, I just said I'm the light of the world, but that would not be enough. My Father also said that. Well, when did that happen? One day Jesus looked at his disciples and said, There are some here who will not die before they see the glory of God revealed. And in Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 5, we see that happen. It says, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. I always add, and we'll sing Kumbaya. I'm sorry, it just always sticks in my head. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, here's the witness, this is my beloved son. With whom I am well pleased, listen to him. There is the Father with him. But that's not all. It's not just the works. As if the Father's word was not enough. After all, 
Only three heard it. But we have another testimony that he is the one and only promised Messiah. And that testimony, that proof is in the resurrection. So we have his works. We have the testimony of himself and his father. And then we have the resurrection. Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 40. Matthew chapter 12, 38 through 40. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. Prove who you are. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but so no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Listen. Not four days, not five days, not six days, not a week, not a month, not a year, not a decade. Three days he will lay in the grave and not one day more because on that third day, God the Father is going to raise the Son of Man from the dead. And he did. In the Old Testament, that promise had been, you will not allow your Holy One to see decay. And when Jesus stepped forward, that prophecy and that promise was fulfilled. And this is why they were trying to silence Peter and John, because that proof and that testimony was devastating to everything they believed in. In Acts chapter 26 then, verse 23 we read these words as Paul is preaching, that the Christ must suffer and that by being first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. The Father said, this is my son. Listen to him. Jesus said, I'm the light. His resurrection tells us that he is the light of the world and only he. Romans chapter 1, Paul puts it like this, verses 1 through 4. Would you pay close attention? Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus We are absolutely certain that he is the one and only by his works, by the testimony of him and his father, and by the resurrection from the dead. That's the first point that I want you to understand when we speak of proclamation. Peter has that. And so he steps out on the world stage and he proclaims this Jesus who you crucified. This Jesus is the anointed one that the apostle, that the prophets and the laws declared would come. Do you remember now? After Jesus rose from the dead, there were a couple of disciples. You'll see a mural on the back wall on the other side of this wall. It's the road to Emmaus. And there are two disciples that are walking along and Jesus has just risen, and they don't know it yet. All they've heard is he was dead, and then they did hear that the women say he's risen, and they're just totally confused. And they don't recognize Jesus, although they are his two of his disciples, not two of the twelve, but two of his disciples. And Jesus goes, what are you guys talking about? And he goes, this guy Jesus, we all thought he was the Messiah. We all thought. I was sure. But they killed him. And then some women said that he raised, but you know how women are. I, I added that part, but I mean, it's, it's in the context. of the, At that time, look at Jesus' response. Luke 24, verses 25 through 27. He said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. O foolish one and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interprets to them in all the scriptures the thing concerning himself. Now, please get this. There are two ages, this age and the age to come. Now, depending on your eschatology, this age is divided either into two parts or three parts, depending on your eschatology. I'm only going to deal with two parts this morning, just to keep things simple. This age that's divided into the, those two parts, you can look at your Bible and see those two parts. You have what is called on your Bible the Old Testament and the New Testament. A better word for that is the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So this age is divided into two parts. The first part under the Old Covenant was an age of promise, preparation. And the way that God dealt with the nation of Israel and with the nations around, the way that God took them through the Red Sea, the way everything he did with his son Israel, you can find Jesus in every chapter. It was an age or an era of this age of promise and preparation. The sacrifices in the altar cry of him. The Passover lamb speak of him. The ten plagues of Moses speak of him. And that old covenant is divided into two other parts. The law and the prophets. The law and the prophets. Moses writes the law. The prophets come after. And both of them are speaking on every page of the coming of the Messiah and the saving work that the Father had intended before he had ever created anything. The promise that he gave to Eve, one of your descendants, that's where it starts, one of your descendants, will brew, will crush, I'm sorry, the head of Satan, undo the work that has happened here this day. He will remove the curse that I am placing upon you. He will give you new life, the life that you have lost. When I said you eat that fruit, you die. You die, but he will come and he will give you a new life. It will be an everlasting life. He will reconcile all of fallen creation. Mosquitoes won't drink blood anymore. Everything was promise and preparation. The law and the prophets. Jesus starts with Moses and then reads through all of the prophets and it's all talking about him. Peter, when on that day, when he stood, when that man was healed and he proclaimed Jesus Christ, faith in that name and the name itself healed this man. He was be the, be at the beginning, at the opening days of the era in which you live, the era of proclamation. All that came before was preparation and promise. On the day that the, the Spirit of God poured out on His church, that began the age of proclamation. Why does He tarry? Mercy and grace. So that His saints can continue to, to proclaim that in that name, and only that name, is salvation and healing and health and all that we need. This is the era of proclamation that you live in right now. In fact, in this, in this Luke chapter uh, uh, 24, uh, verses 44, after those two, uh, go, they, 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 they take Jesus to dinner, he breaks the bread and their eyes open and they go, it's Jesus, and he disappears. I hate that. We just had a wonderful worship service. God forbid if at 12 or 12.15 we walk out of here and it turns off. God forbid. He disappears. 
Well, they turn around and go right back to where they'd come from, Jerusalem, because they've got some news to share. And they go to the 12, or the 11 at this point. They're called the 12. And they say, we were walking on the road, and this guy joined us, and we never heard anybody preach like him. I wish somebody had recorded that sermon. I guess, but then every sermon after that would have fallen so short. And so they tell the twelve, we've seen him. Verse 44, Luke 22, then he said to them, uh, suddenly Jesus appears in their midst. And then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. My. Do you know that if you receive Jesus as your Savior, the Bible says that you are now a spiritual man and you have the ability to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. This is the day of proclamation. This is the day you proclaim. This, is, this, this time that you live in, in this nation, is not an accident. You were born here, and you're in this city, because he brought you to this city, and he brought you here that you might proclaim the name of Jesus. That is the purpose of your existence in this era. In this era. He says... Beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. We're on the other side of that event. You need not hesitate. You are now clothed with power from on high. Your adversary may have lied to you and told you you're not. He may have said, look, you have no power. He's lying. You do have power. Speaking of these two er er uh, ages or these two eras in this age, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 2 says this, Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by the Son. Do you see the division that takes place? Before he spoke through the prophets, but now he has spoken through the Son. You are living in the era of prophets proclamation, who he appointed as heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Matthew chapter 17, once again, verse 5. Remember when Peter says uh, to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. Who's there? Jesus. Oh, Peter loves Jesus. Oh, Peter loves Jesus. And Peter is mesmerized by Jesus' words, and Peter believes that he's the Lord of life. Peter is the one that makes the proclamation, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Peter is the one that says, where can I go? You have the words of life. Oh, he, as a Jew, loves this Jewish Messiah. And standing next to him is Moses, the lawgiver, the great savior of my nation, the George Washington on steroids. Because it's not just any nation that he's the father of, but the elect, chosen vessel of God, Moses. This one that delivers them out of slavery is right there. But who else is there? There's Moses, the lawgiver, but who else is there? There's Elijah, the supreme prophet. John the Baptist comes in the spirit of Elijah. They say, hey, how is it that uh, it says the, the, the Messiah can't come until Elijah comes? And Jesus says, he did come if you can, can understand it. There's the law, there's the prophet, and there's the Christ. But now listen. The voice from heaven responds to Peter. There's three. What three amazing figures? No, Peter. The law and the prophets, 
or an Asset sign. This is my son. Listen to him. This proclaimed his arrival, but now he has arrived, and he is the revelator of all truth. What had been hidden in the law of the prophets, he brings out. This is why he speaks and he says, the true scribe is the one that can take from the old and from the new and bring them both out. You're in an era now, the law and the prophets speak of him, but now you're the one to proclaim him. And you have the words of life given to you by the Lord of all life. Matthew chapter 21, verses 18 and 19 says, in the morning as he was returning to the city, have you ever wondered about this? He became hungry and seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went and found nothing on it, but only leaves and said, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. You know, people look at it and go, that's so mean. Some say, well, this is an image of the Jewish nation. No, it's not an image of the Jewish nation. It's an image of the old covenant. See, it says that the fig tree was out of season. There was no fruit on it, but plenty of leaves. Why? It was out of season. But when Christ arrives, it is the season for fruit. This tree can't bear the fruit. Nobody can ever get saved by going to temple worship. I don't care how many rams you slaughter, how many sheep you kill, how many doves you, you spill their blood on the altar before God. It can never forgive sins. It can never justify anyone. It just pointed to the one who could. The Jesus Christ who Peter is proclaiming. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. In speaking of new covenant, in speaking of new covenant, in speaking of the covenant you have, when Christ said, this is the new covenant in my blood, in speaking of new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. I didn't write that. And what has become obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. You can't pour new wine in old wineskin. You are living in an era of new covenant which supersedes by far the old. How did we get to be so blessed? Well, what do we proclaim? This is the era of proclamation. What do we proclaim? When Peter was brought before the council in Acts chapter 4, verse 9 through 10, here's what he answers. When they said, you're speaking of resurrection and you're talking about this one that we said is not the Messiah. And it annoys us. Peter says this, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed, how do you argue with that? Are you busting my chops because I healed a guy that was lame? Is that what I'm on trial for? No, of course not. That's the same argument they brought to Jesus. Are you, are you persecuting me because I healed a blind guy? No, I'm persecuting you because what you preach. Well, can you explain to me if what I'm preaching is false? How did I just heal the blind guy? You're examining me when the lame guy is right there in front of you saying that my words must be true. If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known. Here's the proclamation. Let it be known to all of you, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Well, okay, all right. Let's, let's, that's great. That's in the Bible. But let's get real. Let's get to real life. Let's get to 2022. Things are different now. We can't do that. How can we make that proclamation? After all, I've never seen a lame man heal. 
See, it's, it's really easy, Peter. It's really easy. Everybody saw you do a miracle, so of course whatever you say, of course you can proclaim. I can't do miracles. I can't proclaim. What am I going to proclaim? Listen to me right now. Listen real close. Around this room right now, there are people who were in drug addictions or alcoholism. Around this room, there were people who were trapped in sexual immorality. There were people who were charged. They were prosecuted as criminals. There were people here who were suicidal. There were people in this room right now sitting in your midst that Jesus Christ has miraculously healed, and every one of you is a testimony to the name of Jesus Christ. Every one of you, you have all the power you need to proclaim his name. Listen, if you have problems, somebody goes, how can I know for sure that Jesus is the Messiah? You say, I've got a knucklehead I want to introduce you to. His name is Randy. Let me tell you who he used to be. Era of proclamation. And what an incredible word we have to proclaim. And you don't need to go to school to learn how to witness somebody. You don't need the Romans road even. All you need is to tell them, how did he save you? Tell them your story. Well, it's getting wild up in here. We raised hands. We amen. We applauded. It's almost like a live church. Hallelujah. Amen. What did you hear today? Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen and amen. We have no excuse but to tell our story to everybody. What else? This is the day of proclamation. What else? You can proclaim. Yes. Anything else? He's alive today. Amen. Amen. What else? Anything else? Tell your story. Anything else? No. They're going to hate you no matter what. Mondo might as well earn it. Right? Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask the worship team to come.